Welcome everyone. We're going to let the uh, the virtual room populate for just about 30 seconds and then we will kick things off. Hope everyone's having a good morning or afternoon or evening. <clears throat> Just a few more seconds and we'll get started. All right, let's do it. More people will trickle in, but we've got a good group already. Um, so hello and welcome uh, to this week's edition of Welcome Change. Uh, for those of you who are joining for the first time, these are our Bi-weekly conversations uh, with Ashoka Fellows, almost like a, a news hour uh, where we showcase the, the insights and, and uh, the wisdom and the solutions from social innovators um, about a relevant social problem. Uh, I'm Michael Zakaris, I'm director at Ashoka United States, uh, and our guest today is Sarah Horowitz, uh, Ashoka Fellow, former labor lawyer, uh, former chair of the board of the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, uh, and founder of Freelancers Union. Um, Sarah is a, a leading voice on labor in this country and just came out with a book entitled Mutualism, Building the Next Economy from the Ground Up. Uh, so Sarah and I are going to talk for about 15 minutes uh, or 20 minutes, and then we're going to take questions from folks listening in. Uh, you can submit a question anytime via the Q&A button uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen. So let's jump in. Sarah, it's great to have you here. Great to be here. Thanks. So, so let's start first with a, with a definition, because I suspect uh, many on this call don't really know what the word mutualism means. So, so what are we talking about here? What is, what is mutualism? Yeah, so first, I think what we should know is that mutualism is everywhere. We see it in nature. Uh, we see it in our unions, cooperatives, the mutual aid groups that have formed all over the globe, and the faith communities that people are in, we're in, in our areas, and they are in our local areas, our countries, globally. And when you look at all of those together, you can really see that a mutualist organization has three elements. And the first is that it's really defined by the community, a community with a social purpose. What do we need? What do we want to build together? The second is what I call an economic mechanism. So for unions, it could be dues. For others, it's subscriptions. I think as the world evolves, it'll be the distributed ledger where we're exchanging time, perhaps not money, or just all sorts of new things with alternative currencies. And the third is a really long-term focus, really having the ability to pass things on from generation to generation, or at the very least, not to have a short-term focus. And when you look at that together, that really is what makes up mutualism. Hmm. And so, it, it, I mean, it's very broad in that sense, right? Which is, which, which means it's, it, as you say, it's showing up everywhere. Um, uh, it, and, 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 it, and it reminds me of, of change making. You know, Ashoka talks a lot about change making and, and this vision of everyone a change maker. And to the extent that mutualism is, is groups of people coming together to solve problems, <laughs> uh, it, really is, it, it really is sort of two sides of the same coin. Yeah, in fact, I, I really feel, first of all, as being on the board of Ashoka and getting to watch what everybody is doing, it really uh, is clear. First of all, I think globally, uh, a lot of countries are way ahead of the US and, and Europe and the UK because these are just growing and there are just these patterns that you see, which are change agents, change makers coming together with others and really knowing their community. And one of the first things that you do when you're trying to build mutualistically is you look for the pattern and you look for these groups and Ashoka is doing this all over and has been. So I, yeah. I think you're right. There's a very interesting and deep connection. So obviously a lot of your book is, is looking ahead uh, at the economy we need to build toward, but I wanna look back a little bit first uh, in, in two ways. So first with your own trajectory and experience founding Freelancers Union, and second with the history of mutualism more broadly. So, so let, let's start with you. Take us back uh, 20, 25 years ago. What is Freelancers Union? Uh, why did you need to found that organization in the first place? So I would say actually what I'm realizing in writing this book and talking to people is that I actually grew up mutualistically. So my grandfather was vice president of a union my grandmother lived in union housing until she was 96. 
<laughs> my parents formed a babysitting cooperative and it was just an orientation around people coming together when they don't want to spend so much on babysitting or they need affordable housing. And so I think when I started Freelancers Union, I looked to my North Star, which was the Amalgamated Clothing Workers Union, which in the 1920s had built insurance and banks and affordable housing, and then took their money to subsidize education and art and poetry and summer homes. And so that it was an expression of how you start with an economic base and you build, but you really focus on the full dimension of what it means to be human, but making it a reality because of the economic base that you built it. So I started the freelancers union because freelancers had, were not allowed to form unions in the US because they're independent contractors and started with these principles of bringing people together to solve one of their biggest problems, which was lack of affordable health insurance and healthcare, and then started to build out the economics of it with a, a nonprofit as the owner and a for-profit sub, which was an insurance company, and then built a board and other kinds of organizations. So that really was the impetus for me. But then I would say the thing that's really clear, and I think this is true globally, is when you look at every great social movement for, in the US, particularly the civil rights movement, the trade union movement, they're all built on a base of mutualist organizations that many of which started as like Ashoka, Ashoka you know, organizations that start with an idea and a person or a community. And so when you look, and I'll just run through this quickly and you know, jump, jump on this, but if you look at the US in particular, after our civil war, there were no places for freed slaves to bank or to bury their debt. And these arose were these benevolent associations. And those became very important and connected to the black church. And then you had the first black craft union, which was the sleeping car porters and a wonderful leader named A. Philip Randolph. And the leaders of those organizations were the ones who built and formed the March on Washington and were mm. the strategists. And what it shows is that there's an arc through generations, which is why you have to have a multi-generational view. So you start to solve locally, you start mapping to the other mutualists in your area, you start to then be able to have the infrastructure for massive social transformation. And that's the undergirding of democracy. And, and that's what we're in trouble globally right now is mm. we just have to get these, this infrastructure for democracy to be strengthened. And it's through these mutualist organizations. Yeah, and 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 as we're looking back a little bit, right, which you just mentioned, there, there, you know, mutualism has a very a very long history um, in this country, even before this country was a country, and also around the world. Um, and 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 tell us a little bit more about right the relationship between these what started off as very small organizations or small unions, and how that then informed much broader social policy, um, whether it's civil rights, whether it's integration in the military, whether it's stuff that was happening in the New Deal, you know, we, we tend to think of this, of these policies as coming from above. But one of the points you make multiple times in your book is that actually a lot of these ideas started in the very kinds of organizations you're talking about. Yes, yes. And in fact, you know, I think it's a really important point about what is the role of government, because I think that what you see is that often sort of the conservative worldview is that individuals should just interact with markets as isolated individuals. But we've come to have a parallel view of an isolated individual going to government. And really what we need to do is say, no, 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 the number one job for government is to build out these mutualist organizations like FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt did with the unions and the New Deal in the 1930s. And that I think is, probably one of the most important things is to see almost like you're putting together the pieces of a puzzle that it's not looking at the puzzle at the end and saying that is a beautiful picture. It's really having the ability to say each piece of that puzzle really mattered. And we couldn't see the whole until we kind of got some clump of the pieces together. And mm -hmm. what we've forgotten how to do, particularly in the US, is how to build those organizations. Like literally we don't have classes, civic classes about 
How do you solve problems? How can you be a change maker? How do you then go and start to know that you have the power to immediately start? And that's where you don't need government, you don't need a big budget, but you can just immediately start something. And right. that is the basis of social entrepreneurship in many ways. And, and right, that's that again, this comes up multiple times in your book where you actually, you, you, you said that we've, we've sort of lost our mutualist muscle memory, right? And, and, and so there's this sense that uh, we've, you know, you imagine it as, as maybe streams that, are, that, are, that keep refilling a lake, uh, but when those run dry, you know, the lake starts to, to run dry. And so if we're not paying attention to the source, uh, then, then we're, 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 we're hurting. Um, so tell, tell me a little bit more about that in terms of this used to be something that seemed fairly natural, right? I mean, the way you tell these stories, this was not, you know, you weren't getting a degree necessarily in, 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 in mutualism, right? It was, it was sort of common sense. And yet uh, there must have been factors that have slowed down that, uh, that exercise and these kinds of organizations that were fairly deliberate starting in the 70s and 80s. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that one thing that you can see right now in the last 10 years, and we're going to see a lot more of, is every time there's a national disaster, people have their impulse to come together and take care of each other, help them get food and medicine, help find shelter, help get materials to rebuild. And what happens, particularly in the United States, is that FEMA, our federal agency, comes in and is like, okay, we got it. Like, thanks for all that good work there. And then the worst part is they outsource the rebuilding typically to the for-profit sector. Mm. So they don't even bring these groups. And why do we care? Well, it's, it's, we care because every, every group is important, but why do we care? Because we actually are building really incredibly important infrastructure all over the place. And instead of learning and building our policy into that, we're just reinforcing inequality by not by extracting the wealth out of every community. And so I think that that's this metaphor, but you really see that that started to happen after World War II. And mm -hmm. that before that, we really did build out, um, you know, Benjamin Franklin built the first fire mutual. If you go to any country, people have come together and built mutuals and cooperatives for food and shelter and basics. And the difference is, is that really after Ronald Reagan in the United States, we just stopped investing in our institutions. The right, I think, was much more of an attack. And the left was almost a benevolent harm. Mm -hmm. And the more that the, the left has turned it into more of a charitable strategy and not an empowerment strategy, we're left not having the infrastructure and I think what we just saw what happened in the United States where our democracy has, has and is being so tested, we didn't have those institutions ready. Yeah. And people are hungry for that. They want to have government be local. They want to get their training and retirement and healthcare from institutions they care about that are co-designed with them because we're all different. We speak different languages. We have different cultures. So let's let's make that a strength and build into that. So let let's yeah let let's talk let's talk about present day and kind of looking into the future now because you know so first of all as an aside you know those those of you that know Ashoka know that we often talk about our fellows as as people who are uh, they're almost like uh, fortune tellers that they're they're looking into the future they're seeing the world five and ten years ahead well Sarah clearly in your case. The fact that you're dealing with freelancers union and independent contractors 20 to 25 years ago when that was still a relatively small portion of the workforce and now it's just exploded right and, and so much of the workforce is going in that direction so you're obviously way way ahead in terms of, of your idea but but it feels like you know the workforce is, continues to change very quickly even before the pandemic people were feeling more isolated more vulnerable you know working harder but falling further behind uh, and, and that's only accelerated and of course, this against the backdrop of deep and, and widening uh, inequity in our economy, especially along racial lines. So why is mutualism such a key ingredient for how we move forward uh, in the right way? So, so much of our economy it is predicated on this idea that we are going to grow and grow and grow. And what we have to really say is, no, we are not going to grow and grow. 
it, it's not good for the planet, it's not sustainable. We're already seeing that the cities, the budgets, when we come out of the pandemic are going to require, there, there's gonna be so much need that we're going to have to figure out that we actually have to do a mutualist strategies as the mutual aid groups have shown us. And what we'll see is that the gatekeepers of the mainstream won't really get this yet because things are working pretty well for them, right? If you're pretty wealthy, you're just buying your safety net, like all good. And if you're like in private equity, like the world is pretty sweet right now. And so what we have to start to do is say, the only way that we're gonna start building back is if we do the building blocks, start with what we can build, identify the mutualists in our area, but then start to move up market. And that's the piece where we have to start to understand our money and money flows and capital. And to me, the most important thing is that we change the tax policy. So it's not just nonprofits that get the 100% tax breaks, but mutualists, and then make foundations and mm. endowments have to invest in mutual because they're extracting so much of the benefit and it's just going back to too isolated a community. It's not good for democracy and it really is not good for the economy. This will create a much better tax base of people who are committed to their local areas who want to see it grow. And then when you start looking at some of the bigger implications of that work around artificial intelligence and other things, we don't make the same mistake and say, hey, I'm just for guaranteed income. Let's just give it to isolated individuals. We say, no, 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 great idea. Let's do it through mutuals. Let's make it so that people have agency over this money through collectivity. And, and this is a theme that you've, you've mentioned sort of the isolated individual multiple times today. I mean, it seems like a lot of this is about community, right? Versus, you know, it's, it's about, uh, yeah, I mean, mutuality is, is in the word, obviously mutualism. And so it's just, it's sort of interdependence. Um, and, and I think those of us who, you know, who've lived through this pandemic, those of us who've been lucky enough to have some access to family or kind of pod, I've been lucky to have my my uh, folks here nearby, which means support for child care, which means, and I couldn't imagine sort of what we would be doing without that. And so I, I think of, you know, in, in some ways, it's, again, it's a very straightforward concept of either you're sort of this lone agent in the world, um, or you're, you're stepping in and greeting these challenges as a group. I mean, I, I was just interested in talking with the teachers union. And, you know, when you look at how that seems went down here. It really went through the pharmaceutical companies because they were in communities. But there were a lot of people who were in nursing homes and th they could be reached through their nursing home. But what about the independent people who are older who really didn't know technology? So the teachers union has a retirees group and they were able to mobilize. And that's just the example that not only do mutualists co-design better programs because there's a lot of people saying, this is what I need, that's a good idea, that's a bad idea, they have some numbers to test it. But they also over time can really refine, you know, what, what it is that, that we need. And it's that co-designing that we've really lost and building it up from there. Um, because if we don't, what are we left with, right? And I think that's the question, like what is the alternative when we're looking at the budgets we're gonna be looking at? Um, and there's real money out there. It's in procurement and all these other ways. So let's just redesign how the streams are, are going. Mm. So I wanna, uh, I wanna open it up uh, the chat here and uh, because uh, one thing I'm curious about for people who are listening in from, from you know, in the US, but also outside the US, uh, is, is, as you mentioned, mutualism has existed, you know, uh, for, for, for decades and centuries uh, outside the U.S. Uh, I'm curious if, if people in the chat can drop uh, some examples of mutualist organizations that they're familiar with or cooperatives that they either they know of historical examples or ones that they actually interact with on a regular basis. It'd be fun to see some of those examples um, populating, uh, just because again, this is this is something that I think we it, it's probably more ever present than we even realize. Um, and as that's happening, um, uh, I, I want to ask a uh, ask a question from from a listener uh, who's who's saying, other than Freelancers Union, have you seen other great examples of labor mutualism in response to the rise of 
the gig economy that's exploding yeah. right now? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And in fact, what you can see is that there are so many organizations that have arisen. So there's cooperatives of drivers. Um, there are the Rideshare Drivers Alliance, the Taxi Cab Workers Alliance, Coworker, the National Writers Union. You start to see that, in fact, when you know the future is here, you know, and when you were just talking earlier about if you look at the Ashoka Fellows, you can see the future. You really are seeing what the next labor movement is going to be like, and it is again these workers coming together and just starting to organize for the things they need and figuring out how they're going to pay for it. And I think what we have to do is take off our 1930s mindset in our brain about how things ought to be and let it, let it develop, let people through this creativity form what they need, and then let's start to give them a job. And I think that's how you get to scale is the government says, these are going to be the institutions that we're gonna to go to for training, healthcare, retirement. And once they have a job, that's how they can scale. So we have a question from, from Paul uh, and, and the background, we, we, and we spoke about this a couple of weeks ago, Sarah, which is that, um, and it can be traced back to Reagan or maybe even earlier, the kind of, uh, the narrative in this country in particular about organized labor and unions has really, you know, really, really started to shift then. Uh, and, and, and that kind of got us in this cycle of unions declining, public sort of support and, and of unions declining as well. So he's asking, you know, he's basically saying individualism has this strong storied foothold in American life. Collectivist thinking, you know, is, is often demonized. Um, you know, it's about markets and private property and consumerism. Uh, and there's this sort of death grip of, of individualism in some ways. So he, he's asking, can you name particular uh, examples in the market economy, exemplars in politics and social organizational life that you see are aggressively taking up the mutualist cause right now um, that maybe can start to combat this sort of hyper individual market based story. Yeah. So first of all, like, let's just be clear that we have these dueling like DNA strands through history. And it really is this hyper individualism really has been reinforced by, by the politics of Ronald Reagan. And, and it is taking out that economic undergirding. We used to have mutual insurance companies owned by policyholders. And starting around 1983, three years into Reagan's term, we started to demutualize them, which meant that private equity made a boatload of money and the policyholders got, for the most part, worse and more expensive policies. So what we have to do is we have to start to build where we can, change our mindset away from being just critiquers. It's not okay just to say the 10 things in 140 characters that are wrong with the world. Be a grown up and start to organize, especially with people you don't always like, but you have a shared vision and that's how we start to build it. You can start to see all sorts of examples in the red states in the US in particular, the conservative inner states, the agricultural co-ops are huge. They're a trillion dollar industry. Our pension funds in America fund private equity and venture capital. They do, like mm -hmm. it's not kumbaya. It's not like warm and fuzzy. Workers work hard. They put their money into a pension and we've set up a system where they say bye-bye and they get supposedly the highest returns. So we just have to rejigger the way that we're doing it, but I don't think it's just a critique. I think you have to do it by building the base, having the economics, and then you build your political agenda on that. Um, Karina is asking uh, if growth, you know, growth is no longer the objective, uh, what, are, what are our metrics of success uh, in the future as, as we think about sort of a mutualist future? So first of all, I, I think growth can be wonderful. I just think it has to be realistic, right? So I don't, I don't wanna live in a world where there are no markets and where there's no private sector. I, like, I, I think that would be scary. I think what you have to do is start to really get to that question of what is success. And I think what you wanna to start to do is reframe the question around what's the provision for human beings that make it so that our children can have the lives that are fair, that you can, have a place to live, that you have decent food and education. 
and that there's agency in your community for people to come and take care of one another. I think it's really interesting for local elected officials because if I were, you know, the grand poobah of a very local area, the first thing I would do is I would map the area. I would say where are the churches and mosques and synagogues and temples and yoga studios and centers of contemplation? Where are the unions and the credit unions and the farmers markets and the mutual aid groups? And then I'd go and talk to them and say, what, what do you need? And then I would take what their issues are as my issues and that would be the political base. And that to me is how we define what the metrics of success are because we're now starting to say locally, how are we gonna repurpose those dollars? Let's go to our state capital and say, we wanna be ready for procurement because we wanna build this kind of housing that's got solar energy and green and free of toxins and architected with a community garden and community rooms so we can have life events do you see what I mean? And that's yeah. how you can redefine it. Yeah, I mean, it's so much of it, it seems like comes back to unlocking the flow of dollars, you know, and, and or, or tax benefits or sort of nudges that can help uh, these kinds of organizations grow and take off. We know they're already, for example, there are, there are tax benefits and perhaps there should be even more so for, you know, uh, companies that sell to their workers, right? And, and, and sort of employee-owned uh, models. And, and, and so the way that the public sector can, can nudge things in that direction, um, it's, it seems like yeah. that's a huge lever. You know, I think it, it's, a, it's a funny combination of, it's, it's really an economic argument. This is really about economic development that's sustainable, but it's also about human beings leading three-dimensional lives. And it's, you know, solidarity has two elements. The first is economic interconnection, and the second is something spiritual where we realize we're about something larger than ourselves. That is solidarity. And mutualism is really about building up solidarity. And it's not, it's, it's because we want to live in that society. Don't build it up for a society you don't want to live in. Make it so that you have like food growing where you want and really great places to have kids swim. You know, this is about our enjoyment of our lives and making that realistic. Mm. And by the way, we're getting lots of great examples from around the world uh, uh, in the chat here. Thank you. We've got, um, right, we've got um, uh, Mondragon in the Basque country, which is, you know, one of the most famous uh, and biggest in the world. Um, Bronx Cooperative Development Initiative. Yes. Um, Karina's talking about uh, in Romania, the, these um, houses of mutual help all over the place and as much as 25% of local financial services um, Constanza sharing some good historical examples too. Um, our fellow Kara, she's saying, uh, she has a question. So her husband is Swedish and she's saying so much of what you're describing is intrinsic to the Scandinavian collectivist models. Uh, she's wondering how much of the change you're describing is just doing or implementing these more collectivist models without necessarily labeling them, right? And, and in some ways it's what Biden is trying to do around wind energy right now. And Rafi also asked before, he, he referenced the kibbutz movement and then says, you know, mutualism is not necessarily against individualism uh, it's not op the opposite and so how do we get this you know is, is getting the messaging right and almost you know not drawing too much attention to these words around collectivist uh, a smarter way to go so first can i just say you know because we're in zoom we can't just like have people come up and talk for a minute about what they're doing but i think what you would realize is like if we magically could do that it's like Mutualism is really there. It's, it, this isn't like making something up. It's saying we actually have this infrastructure and we're gonna have a set of problems. And if we don't get that infrastructure ready, we're gonna really have a hard time. But I also think like we have to be clear about what we're saying. You know, it's like people, you know, when I organized freelancers, I always could tell who was a successful freelancer. And I don't mean the wealthiest, but the one who was going to make it because they would be like, I meet these people for lunch and I'm in this group and this association. And this is what I do because they were in a web of relationships. And the people who were like in their home, you know, I was like, that one is going to be very unhappy and depressed. And that's what's happening to all of us. So we do really have to be clear about needing each other and then building in these systems. But I would really agree, I think it's with Kara, that in Scandinavia, it, it's about your government policy and how you set this up. You talked about ESOPs from the 1950s, which saw the explosion of employees owning their own companies because we put so much into those tax breaks. 
but it's political because there are people who don't want that. And so we have to really be clear that this is a strategy. It has an economics, a, a, a political, and a spiritual, and it's those three together. Mm. I know we're at the bottom of the hour. Uh, we can go for a few more minutes because we still have a few questions from folks. Obviously, those of you, if you need to, if you need to drop off, uh, you can do so. Um, so another fellow, Jill Violet, is asking, can you say a little bit more about, because you referenced uh, uh, universal basic income or some kind of guaranteed income. How would you imagine mutualism and some form of guaranteed income intersecting? Yeah, I mean, I think that what you'd want to start to do is look locally and and enable people to come together to A, have purchasing power that they wouldn't have if they were alone, that there was a way to help administer like what, what's happening with that money. Let's say people wanna put away money for their kid's education or their own retirement or to not work so that they can spend more time with their kids. But the point would be that you could find the credit unions, the cooperatives, that really could be the ones that are collecting that money and, and helping to galvanize the community around that. And that I think would, would make the difference. I'll give you an example, like the way training dollars are spent. You, I, you cannot make this up, but to this day in the United States, success in training is that a worker is placed in a full-time job with benefits, which is wonderful when it happens. It's just gotten to the point where we then just do not train people and get money to help them go wh where they need to go. Mm. And that's why you need to have this power base to start saying we're designing this wrong. Right, yeah. Um, so another question from, uh, so Brian, we have a listener, Brian, who's, whose experience it sounds like hasn't always been the greatest with, with mutual health insurance companies. He's saying some of the, Mutual health insurance companies of today are some of the more bureauc most bureaucratic and dysfunctional companies. How, how do we avoid that and, and align incentives in the mutual model? I guess you started your own insurance company, so. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, one of the things, like let's, let's take that question really seriously. Like if one of the biggest challenges for mutuals is that the, the sources of capital, like literally where do you go to get capital? Well, there's, it's not coming from government. It's coming from the private sector. The private sector, money requires that you get maximum return because it's for the most part through venture capital and through these kinds of in the places that have these pots of money. So then you have these mutuals that don't get to invest in their technologies and other things, which mm -hmm. then creates that spiral where then they feel compelled to demutualize. So mm -hmm. I think it really is something that you, you see this happening, but by the same token, when you look at mutual health insurance companies and you look at premiums and what's covered, they're better. So it's probably true that they might not be so great for a bunch of different things and cumbersome and their sites aren't fancy, um, but, but that's what we're doing by these capital markets. And I think we, we can't forget that. Mm. Max asks, how do we ensure that mutualist organizations are inclusive um, of all and are not replicating oppressive or divisive systems and ideologies? He's thinking about neighborhood associations or school boards or other models of organizing that may sometimes replicate injustice. Yeah, so I think that there are several things. Like one of the things that I think is really clear that mutualism is a model of self-determination of communities. So it's actually enabling communities to come together like never before. And especially once a, with technology right now, we, we can make it so that people can start mutual aid groups and go on a Slack channel and pretty much find out how to do it really fast. We can, I think the, the opportunity of inclusivity is, is right here and we have to build that in. And then at the same, by the same token, what's important about mutualism is if a mutualist organization is discriminatory or bad, it should, it should end, you know, that you should have prosecution like we do of businesses or other organizations that discriminate. Of course, you'd already have that built in for mutualists, but there's an inherent competition that has to happen between them. You're not looking to build bureaucracy because it has to, in a, in a, in a way, when it doesn't work, it, it should, not have members. 
So I think it's looking at it in those different ways. And I think it's a critical, critical point. But I would say one thing that I have found interesting on this book tour is that when I talk to particularly uh, black and brown communities and especially people under 40, they're like, oh my God, I, everybody I know has been in a mutual organization. Mm. And it's that reflection of realizing that it's all around us. Um, right. I think it's interesting. Well, let's, let's close on a, on a kind of on an optimistic note. I mean, obviously this has been, you know, a very difficult year for so many reasons. Lots of loss and pain and, and you know, I think the economic implications are, are, are being felt and will continue to be felt for some time. Um, but 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 I'm curious as you you know as you think about how we get ourselves out of this and use this moment maybe a moment when people are more open to larger systems change structural changes in our economy, what gives you the most energy? What gives you the most optimism? The the, the biggest sense of possibilities as you look forward. Reality, you know, it's it's really the truth that people are already starting to realize we've set things up where we're too alone. It makes no sense in the market and it just makes no good sense. We know that we have to deal with climate change and racial justice issues and that so much of that is undergirded by the economy and how we set up our capital markets. And so to me, I think that when we come out of this pandemic, which hopefully is soon, and we really start to see what kind of economy we're dealing with, we're gonna naturally be able to start building this way. And that's why I really believe that we have to start to come together. And so come to the website, build-mutualism, which I think is in the chat. And we're gathering people and starting to really build this way. And there's nothing stronger than a good idea whose time has come. And mutualism's time has been with us from the beginning and it will be there for the next generations. But let's make it a concerted plan now. Wonderful. Well, thank you again, Sarah, for spending the time with us. Um, and for those of you listening in, yeah, thank you. And, and uh, look out for a follow-up email uh, with a link to today's recording and, and, and highlights. Uh, we'll have a, a sort of highlight piece to, to browse and share. We hope you'll join next time. Welcome Change is happening weekly now, actually. So every Wednesday across different time zones, um, you can check the link in the chat. Um, we have conversations coming up on indigenous food systems and the future of food, on uh, mental health and teens during the pandemic, um, on deaf culture and early language access. Uh, next Wednesday, we're going to explore with Ashoka Fellow Mark Campanale in London, how climate change impacts financial markets and how investors can support a, a more sustainable future. So lots of good stuff up, up and coming. Um, so thanks again, and everyone have a good day and see you soon. Thanks. Bye, Sarah. Take care.